Hi, my name is Sarah Jakes Robertson. You are about to watch a message that I preached at the International Leadership Summit. This message was really important to me because I was praying about walking into purpose and destiny without getting discouraged, and God just gave me the title, Finish Strong. I pray that this message tremendously blesses you and that you are able to experience God's presence and a reflection of God's vision for your life in a way that empowers you, that comforts you, convicts you, and allows you to remember that you too can finish strong. I also want to let you know that my new book, Power Moves, Ignite Your Confidence and Become a Force, is available wherever books are sold. This book is such a labor of love for me because it is the message that God gave me about reclaiming our inner power so that we can make the types of power moves outside of us that reflect God's glory on the earth. If you have ever struggled with the power of fear, the power of anxiety, the power of depression keeping you confined, then this book is going to tremendously bless you. I want to encourage you to not just get one for yourself, but get one as a gift for other people who are struggling to find their power in their voice. Maybe they're in a season of change or transition and they're wondering, can the power from my last season show up in this season? What does power even look like now that I'm in this new season? I want to walk this journey out with you so that you can make the type of decisions that are a reflection of the work that you've done on the inside. I pray this message blesses you. My subject is finish strong. My text begins in Acts 21. I do feel like there are some members of the delegation in the building because <laughs> got my girls with me. My girls are here. Woman Evolve, I love you. Thank you so much. You really like, you know, not a sorority because, you know, renouncing the letters and all those things, but Woman Evolve just has a thing going on. And I thank you all for not leaving me anywhere by myself, for growing, evolving, establishing yourselves. And Men Evolve, we hear you. We know you want in too. So Men Evolve, just go, go and get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. <laughs> he said, thank you, Sarah. Um, at this point in the text, Paul has made his way to Jerusalem. As he is making his way, before he makes his way to Jerusalem, he recognizes that this visit will not go uncontested. He recognizes that the cost of him going to Jerusalem will likely mean that he will be bound, beaten, and end up in chains. When we enter into the text, he has undergone this purification process. He's gone into the temple. While he's in the temple, some other Jews from Asia see him and they falsely accuse him of having Gentiles in the temples and other things that are kind of true and kind of false, but no matter what, it upsets everyone and they grab him, they throw him outside of the temple, they close the gates behind him, they beat him, they bruise him. Roman soldiers begin to hear what's going on, they come to where he is being beaten and bruised and they take him into custody. When we find this text starting in verse 33, it says, then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out away with him. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen, no mean, a citizen of no mean city. And I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hands to the people. And when there was a great silence, 
he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, great God that you are, thank you for bringing us together. At this time when the earth is so desperately in need of leadership, in our circle of influence, no matter how big or how small, is powerful in your sight. And yet without your wisdom, your strategy, we are not sure what to do with all that you have placed in our hands. And so Father, I pray not just for this message, but for this entire experience, that you would show those who have sacrificed to be in the room, who have sacrificed to say yes, what all is in their hands. May they see it clearly. May they see it multiplying. May they see strategy. God, and as for this word, I ask that you would make it clear to me and to them, that you would allow it to meet them where they need it the most, and you would allow me to decrease, that you would increase. Certainly, you are more than able. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last year, my daughter was in the eighth grade, and we were putting them back in school after having them homeschooled. And we intentionally wanted a school that was small in size to help with their transition, recognizing that going from having one-on-one -on -one instruction and into an environment where there were multiple students in a classroom could be overwhelming. And so we found this small private school, and at this small private school, we did a tour and we registered them, and then we got a phone call a few weeks before school started. And they let us know that our daughter, Mackenzie, who was entering in the eighth grade, would be the only girl in her classroom. Kind of felt a way about that. But Mackenzie, we, you know, I be trying to gentle parents, so we sit down, we talk to her. We're having a conversation. It was just her core classes, so lunch and art and some of the other extracurricular, she would still have classes that would be co-ed, but her core classes would just be her as the only girl. And she was raised with two brothers. And to be honest, it took about two of them to run up on her, because the girl is not one or the two. And she said, I feel like God has prepared me for this. I was like, not you throwing God preparing you. <laughs> Church kids just gonna take. We're like, okay, we'll put you in the class and we'll just play it by ear. Cause I'm one of those parents that, you know, I will come up to the school and like get real unwoman evolved. It'd be woman dissolve if I got to come up to the <laughs> Do you understand? It will be woman dissolve if I have to come up to that school. And uh almost towards the end of her eighth grade year, I was starting to feel like I may have to dissolve a little bit. And so uh, she was doing okay, but in her social studies class, they started talking about racism and stereotypes. And I think under normal circumstances, this would not have been as challenging, but the reality that she was the only girl in the class and also one of the only blacks in the entire student body, it made her uncomfortable. So we have a conversation with her teacher about her feeling uncomfortable because of the conversations. And really it wasn't necessarily to change the entire curriculum as much as it was to help him understand some of the nuances connected to her identity in a school where she is marginalized. For those of you who understand the concept of intersectionality though, this is not foreign. Intersectionality was a, a term coined by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw in 1989. I want to read you the definition that she wrote when defining this work. She says, intersectionality is a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and create obstacles that often are not understood among conventional ways of thinking. We'll notice that before DEI programs were under attack, that intersectionality was a conversation that many companies were having as a part of their organization. It's because it was important that we recognize that we don't just want to talk about pay inequality between men and women. We also have to consider the pay inequality between white women and black women. 
because they live in a marginalized intersection of their identity. Not only are they women, but they are also black women. They have two isms connected to them. Anytime there are multiple forms of marginalization, we experience what is called intersectionality. And while it is rooted in black feminist advocacy, the term intersectionality has included other forms of multiple isms. So if you are an older black man, then you are experiencing ageism and racism, hypothetically, when going out for work or pursuing a new career. To be disabled and to be black is another form of intersectionality. So when we talk about intersectionality, we recognize that organizations become more diverse in the ideas that they create and the ways that they handle interpersonal development within their organization when they realize that not everyone is having the same experience. In the case of McKinsey's classroom, we had to help the teacher understand that when you're talking about racisms and stereotypes, because she is the only one that is black and the only one that is a woman, she may be hypersensitive to how the conversation is taking place. And he became one of our favorite teachers because once he got it, he got it. And when companies begin to understand this as well, they don't just create safer working environments, they also create safer and more dependable marketing campaigns because they recognize that you're not just talking to someone who looks like you. If it is not enough that some of us live in intersectionalities that we cannot control, there is this reality that many of us live in intersections that we've been called and said yes to intersections that may not necessarily be marginalized like intersectionality, but they are polarizing. When we think about the intersections that make us who we are, one, I'm a woman and I'm a pastor. There's some intersectionality there, but there's also the reality that there is an intersecting between my roles as a wife and a mother. Sometimes my husband gets in bed and I think he's looking for his wife and all he's got there is a mother. Have to, <laughs> baby. Everybody groan, right? It's eight o'clock. This bonnet says, I am somebody's mama tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. And it ain't, it ain't big mama. I'm actually, the men and the women who are married or been in relationships understand there are certain pajamas you put on that just let me know tonight is not necessarily the night I'll see my girlfriend. Because my roles as a businesswoman and a wife have intersected in such a way that I cannot be the kind of wife you want, to, want me to be. That word intersect comes from the Latin word to cut between. It means that there are some roles in my life that cut between who I am. I'm an entrepreneur and maybe you're a father. And it doesn't seem like they cut between until you get home and you're so tired having from proving yourself out in the workplace that you can't necessarily be the kind of father that you want to be, but you also don't want to hurt your children, but you're living at this intersection that requires that you be sensitive to what your children need as a father, but also what your business needs as an entrepreneur. It is no wonder we need places like the International Leadership Summit because the reality is that there are many of us who are living in intersections. I'm a man but I'm a creative, I'm an executive, but I'm a Christian, I'm an accountant, but I also want to be an author. I'm living in an intersection. I'm a therapist and a prayer warrior. I'm living in an intersection. I'm a trauma survivor, but I'm also a CEO, which means I can show up in the workplace with strength and create ideas, but then I go home and I'm triggered and I can't talk to anyone in my family because I live in an intersection. And I'm trying to figure out why is it that sometimes obeying God requires that we get comfortable living in intersections? Think about Jesus when he is 12 years old and he gets lost in the temple and Mary and Joseph, they finally find him. And Jesus says to them, didn't you know I would be about my father's business? 
what he says to them is that in order for us to be in relationship, if we're going to really get this thing right, it is going to require that you recognize that I'm living in an intersection. I am the lion and the lamb. I'm your son, but I'm also the Messiah. I'm living in an intersection. And when Mary says that she ponders these things in her heart, it informed me that in order for us to effectively be in relationship with people, we cannot just be in relationship with how we experience them. We have to recognize that to be in relationship with them is to be in relationship with all of the intersections within them, which means he's not just my man. He's a pastor. He's a son. He's an entrepreneur. I'm not just your woman. I am a wife. I am a business leader. I am a daughter. I have these intersections. And most of the time we introduce one version of who we are to a person, but our relationships suffer because they didn't realize that that one version was leading into an intersection. We got to be honest that we're not this or that. I'm this and that. You think you are that? I quite literally am all of that. I'm crazy. I'm brilliant. I'm anointed. I'm surviving. I'm strong. I'm weak. I'm smart. I do dumb stuff. I'm literally all of that. Turn to your name and say, you all of that. You all of that. You got it together. Your life is falling apart. You are quite literally all of that. And if we do not own our intersections, not only can we not effectively be in relationship with others because we cannot present all of who we are to them, but we also find it difficult to fully be in relationship with God. Because God wants to sit right in the middle of that intersection. I'm thinking about the man and the woman in the garden and how the enemy intercepts God's plan for their life should have been a one-way path, should have been very clear. But when the enemy plants a thought in the mind of the woman, now what should have been straightforward has now become an intersection. And Genesis 3 and 15 is really all about how God says, I didn't necessarily want you to be in this intersection, but now that you're in this intersection, I'm going to make sure that I send another intersection that is greater than the intersection that the enemy has created. And I'm going to call that intersection Jesus. And he's going to be 100% human. So he understands exactly what it's like to be you, but he's going to be 100% divine so that he can also be your redeemer. Because sometimes it takes an intersection for an intersection. That's why some of you can't just be with one-way type people. I need some people who have some diversity and some versatility because I'm so complex. It's not that I get bored easy. It's just that if I'm going to show you all of who I am, intimacy requires that you see all of my intersections. When I lift my hands and worship, I'm worshiping because I recognize I got intersections here. And I'm inviting you, God, to help me navigate some of this traffic. I'm a little bit depressed and I'm all so excited. I need you to help me navigate this intersection. I got some anxiety, but I got a big dream. Can you help me get down in this intersection? God, I'm trying to raise the children, and I want them to leave me alone. Can you help me get down in this intersection? I want the marriage to work, but I also don't know if it can work. There are some people in this room who are sitting in an intersection. They're not just sitting in a room. They're sitting in an intersection. stuck at an intersection. <laughs> when Israel finds themselves stuck in an intersection, I'm God's chosen people, but I also keep getting off track. Second Chronicles 7 and 14 says that the Lord says, if my people who were called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, I got wicked ways, but I'm also a called person. I got wicked ways, but I'm also a called person. But God says, if you would get down in the middle of that intersection and start calling on my name, then you will hear from heaven and I will forgive your sins and I will heal your land. How did it happen? I invited God into my intersection. 
We serve a God who answers when we call out. He'll meet us right in the middle of the confusion. He'll meet us right in the middle of trying to balance the family, trying to show up for everyone, trying to build the business and repair the marriage. He'll meet us right in the middle of the intersection. And so many of us want to be so straightforward, so simple, so easy to digest that we miss out on the opportunity to recognize that it is because of our complexity that we are made in the image of God. And it is because of our complexity that we need God to help us understand the dimensions of who we are. You see, I have found out that God knows more about me than I know about myself. So I don't try to find, figure out the intersections on my own. I call traffic control. You call it prayer, I call it traffic control. Sometimes I get down on my knees and I start praying because I'm in an intersection that doesn't make any sense and I don't know who should go first or if I should just stick my neck out there. I don't know how many cars are coming my way, how many ideas are coming my way, how many threats are coming my way. And I could get out there and pretend that I've got it all together or I could get down in the middle of that intersection and say, God, I don't know what deals to take. I don't know what friendships to walk away from, but I believe that if I start crying out to you, that you will help me what to see what I need to turn away from, what I need to say yes to, what I need to go back and repair. He is the God of our intersection. Is it not true? that some of the most powerful scriptures that we recite have power because they meet us in those uncomfortable intersections. Though he slay me, yet shall I trust in him. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. No weapon formed against me. It's not that the weapon wasn't formed. It's just that it won't prosper. And when I start reciting these scriptures when I'm in the intersection, it starts giving me strength that even though I'm confused, God's got it all together. That even though I don't know what's going to happen, that God's going to meet me. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. That means that at some point, even though I'm weeping, I'm going to get to a crossroads. This can't last forever. I, I remember an old song they used to see. I'm so glad that trouble doesn't last always. You don't just sing that song because it's catchy. You sing that song because you recognize that at some point the trouble that I thought would last forever had an expiration date. I feel like somebody needs a reminder that trouble has an intersection. I feel like somebody needs a reminder that depression has an intersection. I feel like somebody needs a reminder that suicidal thoughts have an intersection. That's why the gun didn't work. That's why you're not in the prison cell because you had wicked ways, but your wicked ways had an intersection. I'm going to send a word to break you out of that path you're on. Why then do we have intersections at all? The more that I studied intersections in Scripture, the more that I realized that the people who God used the most were people who lived in intersections, which communicated to me that intersections are gateways. God, help me to say this. Oh, God. So David, David was a king. He was a musician. He was a warrior. He was a liar. Yeah, y'all's David. <laughs> Is that your king? That's your king. An adulterer. We like the intersections that make us feel like I have to balance all of these things because God's given me so many talents. But what about the intersections? that make us look like God's chosen on the other, and then make us look like we never knew him at all. I've been a preacher's kid my whole life. So I recognize that just because you're called, just because you're anointed, it doesn't mean that you don't have demons. 
And don't get me wrong, this is not an indictment. All of us have them. It's just that we, for some reason, only see you as one dimensional. And we don't realize that you're teaching us about the very savior that you needed yourself because you got intersections too, and not just the sexy ones, the kind of intersections that make you have to stay connected to God, because if I don't stay connected to God, I will preach you into a frenzy, then manipulate myself out of my next opportunity, because I recognize that I'm preaching addicted. that I'm leading the meetings, but violating the policies I live in an intersection. This is why we invite him into our intersections. Because if we are to truly believe that his strength is made perfect in our weakness, then we must be willing to then acknowledge the areas of our lives where our own strength and our own weakness are in competition so that we can yoke up with something stronger than us. And anyone that I see God use in Scripture, he used them as a result of them being in an intersection. I'm thinking about Moses, who was Hebrew but raised Egyptian, but because he lived in that intersection, he was able to be the gateway for deliverance. I'm thinking about Rahab, who wasn't just a Canaanite woman, but she was a woman with a revelation about God. She thought she was outside of the skirts of the, t of the city just on accident. No, she was outside of the skirts because she was going to be a gateway for the spies to get into Jericho. The, if I don't allow God into this intersection, then I cannot see how God can use this intersection as a gateway for his glory. So I might as well sit down in this intersection and figure out how God is going to use it. Ruth wasn't just a Moabite woman. She was a woman who converted. And because she converted, she became the gateway for David. And she had an opportunity to go back to Moab where she came from. But she recognized that this intersection that I'm sitting in, though it's complicated, though it's almost torn me apart, that I got a revelation from God in this intersection, and I can't just go back to living like I wasn't intersected by a word that was greater than anything I had ever heard before. So she stayed in the tension of the intersection. She stayed in the hunger of the intersection. She stayed in the grief of the intersection. And when God got finished writing her story, she recognized that it was not just an intersection. It was a gateway for redemption. It was a gateway for breakthrough. It was a gateway to change generations. You want to break a generational curse, you're going to have to sit in that generational curse and sit in the revelation so that you become the gateway. I understand where we've been cursed in the past, but I also understand where we're headed. I got to sit in this intersection so that anybody who walks past in my family can understand, hey, 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 there's another option. I found an intersection that can get us to freedom. Hey, 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 did you know you could really be saved? I found an intersection that can change your direction. Hey, 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 did you know your marriage could be saved? I found an intersection. I found an intersection that can change your path. Whew. It ain't nothing like finding out there's another way that I don't have to stay stuck here that I don't have to stay broken, that I don't have to stay miserable, that I don't have to lose at the same thing that everyone in my community lost at. It takes a certain kind of courage to say, I think there may be another option. I know everyone else on the job is conforming, but I think there may be another option. I know everybody else comes into the job and they code switch and act like they don't understand who they are. But when I come in here, I think there may be another option. It takes courage to be a leader. A leader sits at an intersection, and they look at what the outcome needs to be and what they're working with, and they stay in that intersection until they can produce the outcome that they receive from God by sitting in that intersection. When we first meet Paul in Acts 9, he's on the road to Damascus. He thinks his life, his purpose, and his mission 
has one path. He's going to make sure that as a Pharisee, that he condemns anyone who's following the way. By whatever means necessary, he's on this one track path. And then he receives a revelation from God. And this revelation that he receives from God creates this intersection. And it seems like it would have been much easier for him to just become a believer of the way and just continue straight down that path. But God says, no, I'm going to sit Paul right in the middle of an intersection in which two cultures that are extremely different will converge as a result of who Paul is. Because he's a Pharisee, he is a Jew, he is a devout Jew, so devout that he is willing to kill anyone who believes in Jesus. But he gets a revelation of who Jesus is, and Jesus says, I'm going to use Paul to not just reach the Jews, but he's also going to reach the Gentiles. These are two very distinct cultures, but Paul has been called to live in an intersection that would allow him to touch both Jew and Gentile because he's living at an intersection. I think this is important for many of you who have been called to things that are outside of the box. The Jews and the Gentiles, I mean, you guys are theologians. I'm just a freshman. You all understand that to even be in contact with a Gentile was to defile who you were as a Jew. And for some reason, God says, I'm going to use Paul to spread the message of Jesus to the untouchables that he once was touching. Oh, I wish I could, I wish I could say this the way that I studied it. These two cultures, all of these letters that we see Paul write in the New Testament are letters to Gentiles and sometimes to Jews, teaching them how they're going to live in the tension of these two cultures coming together. God gave me this text because he told me that there are some leaders in 2024 who were called to the intersection of competing cultures. This man is a preacher from the hills of West Virginia. Why is he sitting up here with government officials and civil rights leaders when we're supposed to have the separation of church and state? Because sometimes God places you in an intersection with two competing cultures because you're going to be the gateway that he uses to expand the kingdom in both directions. Science and entertainment, faith and mental health, white and black churches, brown and yellow churches, boomers and millennials. God sat me right in the middle of an intersection because we need one another to expand the kingdom of heaven and we can no longer afford to be separated from things that have influence in the world when we are the kingdom called to take over the world. That means somebody is going to be sitting in an intersection that doesn't make sense to anybody, but it makes sense to them because God knows what he gave them to work with. That means that somebody is going to have to say yes to the tension. The tension of trying to fulfill God's vision in two cultures that don't make sense. I am the church, but I can't just talk to the church because we've done enough talking to each other. Somebody got to get in an intersection and be the church and grab the drug dealers. Somebody got to get in the intersection and be the church and change policy. Somebody's got to get in the intersection and say, yes, I am the church, but I'm also going to change entertainment. Somebody's got to sit in the intersection. Yeah. I gotta, I can't take my time, it's late, listen. No, it's late. 
When I was studying this text, I found it very interesting that Paul receives a very unique start to his journey at living at the intersection of Jews and Gentile coming together. There are a few things that you already know because you've already preached this 18,000 times that I would like to submit for your consideration. <laughs> he starts off blind. He receives this revelation and we know that he's going to live in this intersection and God Jesus says that in order for him to fulfill this mission, I've got to start him the right way. He starts him blind. Blind. Blind? I can't see. I can't even see how I'm supposed to do this. I, Jesus. Is anybody at an intersection and you just can't see how you're supposed to do this thing? Jesus starts him off blind. He needs to be blind though, and so do you. Because you can't be distracted by what you see. And you gotta see it in your spirit before you can see it outside of you. He was blind on one hand, but on the other hand, he was at an intersection. Because though I cannot see with my natural eyes, my spirit is more alive than it's ever been. I came to preach to somebody and let you know that when you leave Dallas, Texas, that your spirit is going to be more alive than it has been in years. I came to preach to somebody who's gotten distracted by what you see. I want to let you know that the only way you can start it is if you're willing to start blind. If you're willing to say, I will not walk by sight. I can only walk by faith. I hear God saying, I'm going to show it to you in the spirit realm. I'm going to show it to you in your belly. I'm going to show it to you in your dreams. I'm going to show it to you. You're going to daydream about this thing. Spirit of the living God, I pray that you would open their eyes, not their natural eyes, but that their spiritual eyes would be awakened, that they would see the intersection you placed them in. I may not see it with my eyes, but I see it with my spirit. I may not see it with my eyes, but I see it with my spirit. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I get joy when I think about it because my spirit sees something that my eyes can't comprehend. I see it in my spirit. I'm trying to be Starts, starts off blind. He starts off being guided. <laughs> Acts 9 verse 7 says to me, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. These are the men who would eventually guide him to Ananias. He's blind, but he's also being guided by people who may not see it, but they hear it. There are some people who will not see the vision, but they'll hear the vision when you express it from your lips. And when you express that vision from your lips, I hear God saying that I'm going to call people to you who will help guide you to where I'm taking you. Don't worry about whether or not they see it. Just recognize whether or not they can hear it. Can you hear it? Because if you can hear it, don't worry about it. I got the sight. It's not for you to see. I'm the leader. I'm the only one who can see it. But if you can recognize the sound, that sound will give you the faith you need. Because faith 
comes by hearing and hearing from the Word of God. I don't need you to see it. I need you to hear it. And if you can't hear it, I got to move on to the next. That's why you got to speak it. So many of you are so afraid of failing that you won't speak it, but you cannot find the people who will guide you unless you are willing to speak it. If you are willing to speak what you see, God says, I'll bring you people who can guide you to where you need to be. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to speak it in this atmosphere. Who are you? Are you an author? Are you healed? Are you whole? Because I want heaven's resources to back up what you see. I'm going to give you five seconds to speak it into the atmosphere. I can't hear you. I can't hear millionaire. I have generational wealth. I'm going to speak it. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but I'm going to speak what I see, and I'll let God do the guiding. I don't know. It's going to be saved. It's going to work out. I don't know how it's going to work out. The children are going to be okay. The church is not going to close. A generation is going to come back to the Lord. The culture is going to understand that the kingdom should be influencing the culture. The culture should not be influencing the kingdom. I'm going to sit in the intersection and I'm going to speak what I see until what I see becomes what you believe. And when you believe it, you better testify to somebody else so they can understand. I got 14 minutes, and y'all don't know how to act. He's blinded. He's guided. But he's also covered. <laughs> so, the person who guides you is meant to get you to the place that God has already covered you in. Their assignment was to get him to Damascus, where he would have an encounter with Ananias, who would tell him his next steps. <laughs> Which means he's blind, he's being guided, he doesn't know what's next. If we follow this text in sequence, he doesn't say, I'm going to put you in the intersection. All I need you to do is say yes, and once you say yes, if you would move based off of what you said, off of what I said, and you would be obedient to what I said, I'm going to show you that I've already gone ahead of you. I'm going to just say this. He went ahead of him and prepared Ananias for his arrival. Today I was listening and I was thinking how there are grants, positions, employees who God has waiting for you to intersect with because you said yes. When you say yes and start moving in the direction of what God says, I hear God saying there's some other intersections along the way that are going to make clear the path God has for you. When we find Paul in Acts 21, I'm running out of time, I'm going to finish. When we find Paul in Acts 21, his obedience to living in the intersection God has placed him in has led him to the temple in Jerusalem. What's unique about this is that Jerusalem itself is an intersection. Even today, it is the intersection of many faiths. It is an intersection at this time as well, and he calls him to Jerusalem. And this is not his first time getting there, but he calls him to Jerusalem. In this instance, I picked it out because this is the beginning of the end of Paul's journey. This particular trip to Jerusalem would be the one in which the tension of him living in an in intersection would become insufferable. First, he's going to suffer it. He goes to Jerusalem, he offers alms, he undergoes a purification process because he recognizes that in order to enter the temple, especially because he's been engaging with Gentiles, that he can't just walk into the temple. He has to undergo a process that purifies him as a Jew in order to go into the holiest parts of the temple. And he undergoes this process. And it made me realize that he was really trying to do everything right. Because when you live in an intersection, you have to show honor for what was 
while also, also honoring what is at the same time. I will be honest and let you know that most of the time when we want to change something, we want to sit in the intersection and we want to judge what was and high, put a hierarchy on what could become, not recognizing that the only way that we can change what was is if we show honor to what it is while also showing how it can expand and become more. If you don't show honor for the way church was, your commentary on what's wrong with it, it lands harshly because as bad as it has been in some instances, the church has been strong in keeping so many of us from the grasp of the enemy. And yes, she is not perfect because the people inside of her are not perfect. And if you're going to change it, you got to at least honor her for what she is. I'm sorry, but there are some of us in this room who have no business being in here. But because somebody dragged us to church, even when we didn't want to go, because we had a praying grandmother, and yes, they may have had rules and stipulations that we want to change, but can we at least acknowledge that before we wanted to change it, it changed us. It made us believe in something. It made us have hope in a time when we had darkness. Somebody laughed on us. Somebody prayed on us. And yes, it could be better and better and bigger, but baby, if it didn't change at all, it's been more than enough for me. Baby, if it didn't change at all, I thank God I had somewhere to run when I was divorced with two children children, starting my life over. I set my hips down, and yes, they may have talked about me, but God was talking to me while they were talking about me. How does someone like Paul who's trying to do everything right to make sure he doesn't step on any toes, still end up in a session. See, you, you, didn't got, you didn't got me confusion up here. He still ends up in a circumstance where he's being penalized for saying yes, accused, beaten, betrayed, isolated. He tried to do everything the right way. This is what they don't tell you about these intersections, is that sometimes you do everything you know to do, and you still end up suffering. You still end up rejected. You still end up isolated because the secret cost of success is suffering. The secret cost of success is suffering. I want you to take a minute and think about all of your successes and what that thing cost you. They see the glory, but they don't see that glory has an intersection. And that intersection is suffering. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Paul did everything the right way, and he gets down to the end when he should be finishing strong. And now he doesn't know whether or not he can even add value in the way that he's used to adding value. Now he doesn't even know what his legacy will be or if he will have one at all. Suffering of knowing that you're so far from where you should be, but tired, like you're already there. That's suffering when you know I'm not there yet, 
but I'm tired because I've been fighting my whole life, and there is so far away the suffering that keeps us from finishing strong. You see, this is why some of us don't get to see success, is because the suffering is enough to stop you in your tracks. I'm building it, but nobody's coming. I'm saying it, but it's causing more friction than it is causing change. I'm speaking it, but nobody's listening. And it's one thing to just take it on the chin and try to be logical. But if we're honest, we have normalized suffering so much that we don't even give it language. We just say, that's the breaks. But if we were to be honest and admit just for a moment that I'm suffering, the church is thriving but the family is suffering, the business is thriving, but the church is suffering, but suffering has an intersection. If you read all of Acts, you'll see that Paul could have ended this suffering at any time. As a Roman citizen, it was illegal for them to treat him the way that they were treating him. But Paul was so committed to finishing strong that he didn't just throw out the Roman citizenship card the moment that he began to suffer. He continued to suffer until he got to a place where he could release what God had given him to say. Oh, I wish I could say this better. You'll notice that in Acts 21, that when I ended my text, it begins to tell us what Paul was about to say. He's at an intersection where he's got suffering and he could make a choice to just let the suffering silence him, or he could dare to speak in the face of suffering. And if he dares to speak in the face of suffering, he will release what God has placed on the inside of him. And for Paul, that was worth the suffering. You see, some of us don't go through the suffering because we don't see the worth in what God has given us. And that is a trick of the enemy, trying to convince you that what God gave you doesn't have any value or the value has been tainted because of what you have gone through but if God gave it to you I want you to know that he does not discount what he gave you if God gave it to you I want you to know that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that means the treasure is still there even when this earthen vessel has been damaged Paul says I still have something to say even in the midst of my suffering Can I tell you, I'm finished. I see that the way he starts is very similar to how he finishes because he is blind to what is happening around him. All that matters is what God has placed on the inside of him. I hear God saying that if you are in this season of your life where you're wondering how you're going to finish and how do you make it to the finish line, I want you to know that you got to finish the same way that you started. You got to be blind to what's happening around you and eyes wide open to what God is doing on the inside of you. He's being carried by soldiers. Sometimes you're going to have to let some people guide you. Sometimes you're going to have to let some people carry you. And then he is coming because sometimes you got to let God cover you in seasons where you're even suffering. He recognizes that this looks very much like what God said it was always going to be. So all I have to do is maintain the start that God has given me. If you're going to finish strong, go back to how you started. If you're going to finish strong, you got to go back to protecting how it started in the first place. What mattered, what didn't. How excited were you? When we're talking in marriages and they're having hard times, we ask them, let's talk about how it started. And we know that Nine times out of 10, if we ask you about how it started and you roll your eyes, y'all in a little trouble. <laughs> because how you start, if you can just get back to how it started. 
If you can just get back to that innovation, if you can just get back to that excitement, if you could just get back to how it started, then you can figure out how to finish strong. Strong in your spirit. We serve a time where strength has been hijacked by the idea that it comes in numbers and impact. No, 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 I'm talking about finishing strong in your spirit. I want to pray with you. God told me as I was preparing for this message that what Paul wanted to give more than anything was the gift of his suffering. <laughs> we know this because Scripture tells us in Philippians 3 that all he wanted was to know him and the power of his resurrection. We all want to know the resurrection. But he said, I also want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Can I just say, there are generals in this room. And I recognize literally I am a grasshopper to a general. That's not self-deprecation, it's true. Because I've seen so many of you since I was little girls. And I want you to understand that you did not give your life Give your bodies, give your families for a generation that just wanted your resurrection. That there are some of us who want to offer you the gift of our suffering too. I wish I could say that better. When I look at the intersection of boomers and millennials and millennials and Gen Z, I recognize that right now this transaction that's happening between boomers and millennials is so critical. It is a delicate walk. Because I'll be honest, we are a generation that it, we are, we're seeking the mental health. We don't want to have experienced trauma, and that is very much so true. I have a trauma therapist. But I am not so intent on avoiding suffering that I don't recognize that in order to be effective at this, I have to be willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel. I am not disillusioned by that. And I want you to know that we saw your suffering, that I know that it cost you. I saw my father this morning paying the price to stand on this platform suffering. I was a little girl taking his shoes off of his swollen feet. They were his feet so swollen we couldn't get them off, but he was still going out preaching to some of you, getting you through some of your families while I was pregnant, while our family was going through it, because he recognized that sometimes in order to be effective, you don't get to choose whether or not you suffer. But even though I'm suffering, I'm still going to speak what God told me to speak. And I'm telling you that if we are going to master passing the baton, that we have to recognize that they're going to pass the suffering too. That you could do everything right, and you might still suffer. But my assignment was to tell you that suffering has an intersection. And that intersection is glory. Don't let the suffering move you out of position. Don't let the suffering make you believe that what you gave didn't matter. I hear God saying, if you stay in the tension, I'll show you the glory. And for some of you, the glory of your suffering is going to be raised up in this next generation. I don't know about you, but I have decided that I will not let our fathers waste their lives away. Our mothers waste their waste their lives away. Our evangelists and prophetess, our executives and CEOs, our Andrew Youngs waste their life away and think that we are too timid and too delicate to say I can handle some of that suffering too. God, I can handle some of that pressure too. So all of us must decide that if we're going to do anything, we're going to finish strong. 
that if we're going to do anything, that we're not going to let the suffering define us. If we're going to do anything, we're going to hold our intersection down because we recognize now more than ever that we have a kingdom of heaven that needs to invade the earth. And because Jesus hasn't come back yet, it is still our responsibility to make sure that the kingdom touches everything that we do. It is still our responsibility to make sure that heaven shows up in everything that we touch. You're not just sitting next to a regular woman. You're sitting next to an intersection. Heaven touches earth through that woman. That is not no regular man you're sitting next to. Heaven touches earth through that man. Heaven touches earth in that office. Heaven said this is not just a regular office. This is not just a regular business. This is an intersection where the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent taken by force because this is an intersection that cannot be shaken. This is an intersection that must stand the test of time. And my name is Sarah Jakes Roberts. And I'm going to hold my square down. Whether it's 40,000 women or 40 women like woman thou art loose. Because this is not a numbers game. This is a kingdom game. And God, anywhere you send me, I'll say yes. I'll say yes afraid. I'll say yes nervous. Because an intersection can't stop me from doing what God called.